Greetings to everyone and welcome to the guest lecture series 2020, an initiative by Technovanza VJTI. This lecture is co-hosted by Gaya College of Engineering and Engineering College Ajmer. This is Urvi Ranjan and I am thrilled to be your host for today. VJTI was established in the year 1887 and is upholding its proud legacy of over a century filled with brilliance and educational prowess. Furthermore, it has thrived in nurturing the brightest minds of our society. Technovanza has always been the prime platform where the flame of expertise has been meritoriously passed on to light more torches. An ardent desire to enlighten young minds and imbibe impeccable qualities within them has been the very objective of the GLS since its inception. Through the VGTI guest lecture series, Technomanza attempts to bridge the gap between students by featuring eminent personalities from various walks of life to share with us their valuable experiences. Pioneers of diverse fields, including Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, Dr. A.S. Kiran Kumar, Mr. Ratan Tata, Mr. Nana Patekar, and many others have graced Technomanza with their presence while progressively illuminating young minds to new areas of interest. Behold, because today we are elated to add a truly inspirational name to our glorious list of dignitaries. Our guest today is not only a brilliant scientist, but also a rare combination of an innovator, technologist, and visionary. Today, we are pleased to welcome the phenomenal Dr. Vijay Kumar Saraswat. Dr. V.K. Saraswat has more than four decades of experience spanning over several fields of defense research. During his illustrious career, he has served as the chief scientific advisor to the defense minister, as well as the director general of defense research and development organization. Dr. Saraswat has been credited with the development of the first indigenous missiles, namely Prithvi, Dhanush, and Prahar. He was the principal architect of the Ballistic Missile Defense Program, which included major technology breakthroughs. With this, India joined the elite group of nations that have the capability to develop BMD systems. Dr. Saraswat brought new dimensions to the strategic defense scenario through successful test firing of Agni-5 and Shorya. Thus, today our nation can boast of reaching every corner in the world with our nuclear-capable missiles. For his remarkable contribution in making India self-reliant in defense technology, he has been conferred the Padma Shri and the Padma Bhushan and several other national and international awards. He presently serves as a member of Niti Aayog and shoulders many honorary positions in both government and academic institutions. So, this small introduction wouldn't do enough justice to you. You have blended the eloquent qualities of hard work and persistence with absolute sublimity, which can never be unseen. We are truly honored by your presence today. We will have a Q&A session after the lecture, so please leave your questions in the live chat below. So, will be sharing with us his expert outlook on the importance of technology transformation using sustainability. So, without any further ado, let's be a part of a conversation of our shared future under the guidance of clearly the best. So, very good evening and uh, very happy to be part of this uh, series of lectures by organized by VJTI, one of the most illustrious institutions as uh, indicated by the compare just now. At the onset, I would like to thank you for an elaborate introduction of mine. Certainly, uh, I will be very happy to share uh, my thoughts with the student community, the teaching faculties, and uh, the practicing engineers. 
the top of uh, the today's my talk is technology transformation for sustainability where we are where we are heading and uh, this certainly has a major emphasis on what technology has uh, done with respect to what technology has done uh, in the pursuit of the science for and human for humanity uh, if you look at what has happened over the last number of centuries the growth of science and technology has been phenomenal and in the recent past it has improved the quality of life of the human beings the emergence of new technologies has opened up myriad applications and now it is left to the ingenuity and imagination of the human mind to explore and exploit them further with the established base of multiple technologies all over the world scientific minds have to come together for new innovations i would like to give you a picture of how the technology has evolved about 5 to 6000 years back uh, bcs and now in the today's 2020 if you look at uh, we belong to what was a stone age which changed into bronze age then it came to iron age and then chemical age plastic age and today's information and knowledge age on the x axis you see how the over the period of time the society has changed society has transformed from agriculture society to industrial society to information society and knowledge society today and on the y axis you see the technology evolu evolution that has taken place from the early days of 5000 bc during the stone age when we were all carving out uh, bronze statues and that was the origin of civilization and then we had the uh, major innovations in terms of materials and uh, and and the craftsmanship uh, and using the natural resources where you built the restless iron pillar of uh, delhi you also did what is called the statues of uh, meta investing investment casting in those years then came the era which was basically called the renaissance era between 1000 1000 to about 19 uh, 1900 and also you notice that we had improved quality of arts and entertainment and scientific innovations took birth resulting into things like because i am a missile guy so i am quoting tipu's rockets of 1792 then after the uh, 1800 the industrial revolution started and uh, that happened with the advent of very variety of uh, uh, scientific processes like steam engines and so on and this created what is we call today the industrial revolution and uh, in that we had the the power the industry the aircraft coming industrial revolution leading to nuclear energy and of course it also had its negative impact in terms of world war 1 and world war 2 and then came 1980s when we entered into the age of electronics and computers where computers laser genetic engineering and all that has come that was the beginning of the knowledge base and today we have the convergence of technologies where we have information biology and bio and the nano revolution taking place and we are now into convergent technologies information and and, uh, and uh, the knowledge base, knowledge application base so this is how uh, we have evolved over a period of time and all these technologies till 2020 have been responsible for making the life of the human beings more and more comfortable and we have brought growth in the system despite the fact that we had uh, population uh, going from what it used to be in the early days to today is uh, almost about uh, 9 to 10 billions in the in the, in the global era and even the indian population going up and the resources of course remain same so as a result of these technology explosions which took place there has been adverse impact of these technologies on the planet earth and that is the engineering has spurred and led the industrial revolution but in the process it has created important classes of problems which are human exposure to toxics in the food air water and soil and then rising demand for energy for transport manufacturing heating and cooling and we also have a serious problem of depletion of non renewable resources like petroleum metals and phosphorus then we have excessive demand of water for 
domestic purpose, agriculture and industry. We have a huge demand for land, for housing, food production and economic activities. An ever increasing number of size of the landfills, ecosystem damage and habitat loss due to the pollutant discharges. And of course, it has impacted the global climate. And this is not the complete list. The list continues on and on and on, as we call it, the litany goes on. So for this, the world has thought over how to change this situation, how to change this trend, and for which the transformational changes are required. My only, uh, my only point on this is that the transformation has just begun. Now, there are t uh, 10 key patterns of change shaping the next decade, and these are uh, happening. We are seeing this happening today. For example, there is the economic turbulence. And you can see during COVID-19 how global economy has taken a downturn. These are all kinds of uh, disasters which are affecting the humanity today. A shift in wealth from west to east and political uncertainty are shaping the landscapes. So there is an economic crisis and the shift of power from east to west. Uh, west to east, that is what is happening. So society today is in transition. Natural resources are being challenged today. There are demographic destinies which are going from one portion to the another portion. There are, of course, generational crossroads, what we call as the demographic dividend, the divide between the young and the old is increasing in a big way. And uh, we are also thinking of uh, that there are geopolitical uh, complexities which are emerging. We are seeing that uh, different nations are becoming uh, more and more vigilant in terms of occupying the territories or fighting for the resources and so on. So these are uh, complexities which are emerging. In addition to that, the science and technology is growing leaps and bounds. As I mentioned to you, we will discuss in, uh, in future slides, further slides about how this is happening. And there's a new platform which has completely changed the scene of the society is the global internet expansion, which has completely reduced the distances and we are next to each other on a day-to-day -day basis. And industries, industries or the enterprises are changing to what we call the enterprise 3.0 from the olden days of uh, the uh, very, very luxury industry in those days. And for all this is certainly also putting a demand and our rethinking on talent, education, and training. Because if we have to meet all these challenges, we have to skill ourselves and train ourselves in that direction. So the greatest challenge for the 21st century is the global sustainability. And all of you know sustainability is an integral part where we talk of environment, society, and uh, the uh, science and technology, as we call it, and economy, as, as we call it. So these are the three pillars which are and always under stress, and we have to look at how to do that. Now, what is the need for this sustainable development? The sustainable development is needed because there is a huge impact of whatever we have done in the past on the climate change. We have increased in atmospheric temperature and extreme weather events are taking place. We have rising sea levels, which is extinction of threats with small island nations due to the climate change. We have society, uh, scarcity of resources, which are in terms of food production, which needs to be doubled over the next 40 years at a time, when almost about 23% of the world's agricultural land has been degraded. We have two-thirds of the world's population, which will be living in water scarce or water stress areas by about 2025. We have over-exploitation of our natural resources, and that is leading to the, the extinction of more than 1 million species and decline of more than 60% of the world's marine fisheries. So this is a very serious situation which is going to affect the planet Earth if we don't do what is called a directional change towards sustainable development. So there are six necessary and desirable transformations which are essential. One of them is the energy revolution. That means we have to facilitate a global energy transformation where 80% reduction in the carbon dioxide emissions will take place by 2050. That's why a number of uh, international and national treaties are being, uh, being organized to ensure that we, we live within uh, a certain level of emissions so that we don't increase the temperature beyond one or two degrees uh, beyond the industrial limits. 
This is one aspect which is very important. Then next comes the food. Because the population is increasing, so the food system transformation has to achieve about 70% extra production by 2050 through sustainable intensification. Our own process of doing agriculture needs a transformation. If we have to produce food for that many number of population, that many number of uh, human beings uh, living on the same landmass. Of course, we are seeing urbanization in a big way. As I'm talking to you in one minute, about 30 people are moving from the villages to the urban areas. That is the kind of movement is taking place. So we are going to have a situation that by 2050, more than about 70% of the population of the, of the world will be living in the cities. So that is a tremendous change which is taking place. It needs to be attended to. Then, of course, population, I mentioned, too, is rising billions. Adapting to the population transition and preparing for a world of 9 billion people tomorrow. In addition to that, we have to look at biodiversity management and transformation and also strengthen the global governance so that we have equity and participation of everybody in the governance. So governance also needs a transformation for sustainability. Now, how do we do that? Uh, we can we can't we can just like that say that we can do it this way, that way, because there are no. So what we should do is we should first see what is called the principle of ABCD. ABCD means we should look at what is what do you want in future. We should have have a good awareness of the future, and that is called A. And then you go back, um, back casting and look at the present. So when you look at the present, you will see what are the issues, as I mentioned to you in my earlier slides. Look at those issues. And then to solve the problems created by those issues, we have to find creative solutions. And those solutions uh, can lead us to the future. But there again, we have to do what is called prioritization. We can't do everything at the same time. So this ABCD approach has to be taken for doing the transformation to sustainability. Now, if you look at uh, transformation, there are a number of steps which are already happening and they will re certainly result in that. What are those? Digitalization for sustainability. That means comply to the planetary boundaries in terms of climate, nature, soil, ocean, and secure your social cohesion. That is what uh, uh, is important. Next one is sustainable digitalized economy and society, where you mainstream sustainability awareness. People should be aware. And network suitability actions, global cooperation, and solidarity. Because you can't do all by itself. If you are controlling the emissions in, say, India, and if China is going to have huge emissions, then it is going to uh, certainly affect the entire globe. So it is a global cooperation is needed in these matters. Integrated and disruptive digital and uh, sustainable transformation. That means you have to have future proved nature human interactions. That means all that interaction what you are going to have, have between nature and human, they should be future proof. That means they will not leave any adverse impact as far as the planet is concerned. So that should be human-centered, human-machine collaborations is very much essential. And this will take care of all intended and unintended disruption and consequences which are happening because of more resource use and emissions, environmental destruction, loss of social cohesion, loss of privacy and integrity protection, which is also ha happening because of the abuse of nature-human interactions, abuse of human-machine interactions. All this will certainly go if we look at this kind of a transformation staircase. Now there are six technology transformations which are which are leading to the sustainable development goals. One of them I mentioned to you is the digital revolution in which artificial intelligence, big data, big data analytics, and data mining, biotechnologies, nanotechnologies, and autonomous systems are going to play a major role because they will certainly bring uh, the efficiency and outreach which will be enhanced drastically and as the equity will be achieved. Then you will have uh, uh, the smart cities which are going to happen and uh, that will give you the decent housing which are, uh, which are within the norms of uh, sustainability, which will give you mobility solutions which will again be non-polluting and also bringing in equity. 
then it will also provide sustainable infrastructure uh, which will again have minimum energy usage minimum wastage and things like that and of course reduce pollution so this is a kind of smart city infrastructure which is going to evolve then food biosphere and water will also be certainly affected by these technologies because you are going to take care of the diets we are going to take care of the nutrients we are also do what is called sustainable intensification and control of bio biodiversity then human capacity and demography uh, will certainly be improved what we call as the human development index hdi which certainly improve india is already increasing now in the last 5 to 7 years there has been a significant improvement on our uh, hdi because education health aging and labor markets and gender inequalities are all being uh, attended to in today's situation and to improve the hdi i think we have to take uh, extra steps in improving the situation then there is of course the need for controlling the consumption and production and for that we need to go for circular economy in which course we have to learn to to shift from 3r that means the uh, production consumption and, and destruction to six r approach where you, you go for circular economy uh, where you are in a position to reuse the same material and redesign and reuse so you have then of course the pollution will get reduced automatically and energy which is one of the most polluting factor has to be decarbonized uh, the decarbonizing uh, carbonization will certainly help um, uh, in, in in controlling the emissions and energy access to all efficiency of then electrification to remote spot and provision of decent services these are some of the things which will be forming part of the transformation now what are the basic fundamental principles which are actually controlling them the principles which are controlling them are computational based experiment based and theory based and the technologies as i mentioned to you are robotic system control mechanics materials and structures energy flows and processes design product development and manufacturing micro and nano systems and bioengineering and they will all generate knowledge uh, and from the knowledge again the technology will get affected that's why you see the two arrows working in the reverse direction so there's a need for basic basic knowledge and applications applications of these will certainly transform mobility it will transform manufacturing sector it will transform energy and environment and it will also transform biomedical life sciences and process and technologies so they will again go back into uh, into into uh, increase of knowledge because these are the grand challenges which the today's uh, system is facing so there are about uh, some new trends which are happening in the technology many of you might be studying some of these subjects for example today we have mixed reality uh, which is emerging as a major technology then you have uh, progressive web applications uh, which is going from stage 1 to stage 10 today we are also reaching the age of hyper automation we are also having what is called uh, serverless architectures and cloud migration as far as communication and data storage is concerned then we have multi uh, cloud strategy not one just multi cloud strategy the communication is changing from 2g 3g 4g to 5g and even tomorrow 6g edge computing is becoming the major uh, major interface which is going to increase efficiency of, uh, of of all our intelligent systems then we are creating digital twins uh, to make sure that we are able to replicate whatever is required in the real time on the digital platforms before we embark upon any technology which will be converted into a reality then of course voice enabled solutions and cyber security because we are on a digital plane today so cyber security becomes very very important technology area which needs a uh, highest attention as uh, as far as our country is concerned so five multi trillion dollar innovation platforms are being uh, there and convergence of them will accelerate and innovate the uh, and advance the innovation what are these platforms blockchain technology genome sequencing robotics energy storage and artificial intelligence they will create multiple trillions in market capitalization over the next 10 decade and you will see 3d printing additive manufacturing immuno immunotherapy energy storage systems autonomous vehicles mobile connected devices all of them will become a reality 
connected by only one one single element and that is artificial intelligence that is going to complete the way internet did once upon a time to the complete society i think ai is going to play a similar similar role the shift is taking place now in this sector we used to have what is called computer centric systems in the in the information communication technologies in 90s then came the era of internet and pcs so we came network centering transforming business processes that's why you, are, you had bpos the call centers and all of them but today the knowledge has been created and human and they are supporting the human activities so we are now becoming human centric and uh, there you have the cloud computing sensor technologies obvious terminals and mobile technology telecommunication all become part of it because man is coming in the loop besides the machine so it is a human centric approach which the ict is taking part the major change which is taking place and again like internet and this is going to make the complete change uh, face of the change the face of the internet is the 5g 5g is an end to end ecosystem to enable a fully mobile and connected society it is going to give you a very high data rate 10 times and the average and peak 100 times the cell edge and peak is greater than 10 gbps mobility will be 1.5 times and walking to almost 500 km per hour devices will be programmable configurable multi band and mode battery energy savings and cost reduction will take place latency in this communication will come down 10 times to average and peak and when latency will be less than 1 millisecond networks will be aggregated highly flexible and scalable and connection density will go 100 times what will happen you will have mobile broadband you will have very high data rate you will have massive number of devices you will long battery life you have a iot sensor network you have an iot control network you have a dense crowd of users very high capacity very high reliability resilience and security and to talk with all very high data rate so this is a kind of a system which is already developing india is also moving forward in that direction i am sure this will become a major helper in terms of enhancing the socio economic satisfaction both for transportation which will become more efficient and safer navigation autonomous driving you will have healthcare system which can be done remote medical examination you already saw the soy during the covid 19 how the remote terminals have been working and providing guidance to the patients directly and uh, this is going to multiply to the remotest of the villages and it can also augment the efficiency of the healthcare system completely then you have it will be extensively used for disaster relief uh, prediction robustness of the disasters and so on it will be a major benefit in a situation like this where you want to go online education distance learning virtual experience and you are already seeing that the kids are learning today through the online classes because they are can't attend and they are handicapped today in some areas where the 4g uh, connectivity is not available or the web is also or the w or the wifi is slow uh, and also the reach is not there in the remote areas so this will with 5g it will get enhanced then you will have uh, richer content you will have multi user uh, high definition ultra high definition system teleconferences what we are talking today while i am talking probably you will be in a position to not only see my face i will be able to see your face and we can have a face to face talk more immersive system relevant both in terms of videos music books and all that home security will be certainly enhanced consumer electronics will be have huge remote control and safety and lifeline systems like collision avoidance rescue operations accidents and distress all of them can be controlled with the enhancement of the 5g technology now these uh, multiplied innovations as we just discussed will feed digital transformation over the next 5 years we all we talked about new technology delivery like it access and skill which is 2007 onwards is taking place like cloud mobile social and big data and today between 2015 and 30 we are in the area of platforms and communities innovation at a scale where i ai iot blockchain natural interfaces and multiplied innovation that is where we are today and where we are going to we are going to a state of autonomy <clears throat> which will be basically autonomous systems 
hyper complexity at scale exponential ai what we have today is only applicational ai you are going to have exponential ai where cognitiveness become an integral part of the artificial intelligence you will have computation being done on the com quantum computing systems and bio digital integration will take place in a big way so this is the kind of transformation is expected in the next 5 to 7 years you will see the evolution of the intelligent internet of intelligent things now we have seen in, in intelligent that we have seen internet of things now we are talking of intelligent internet of intelligent things that means it is a kind of uh, scaling up to a level where the two intelligent devices are going to talk to each other in a more intelligent manner ensuring a better efficiency better output and better outcomes so that will be enabled by the cloud which is 3g 4g and internet of intelligent things which will be enabled by cloud ai which is 5g and near future you will see enabled by the edge ai where you have intelligent internet of intelligent things and that will be enabled by the 6g so this is a kind of transformation which is going to take place in the few years the we are going to have enhancement through digitization the fusion of 5g ai and iot will play a significant role in critical areas i already mentioned some of them like transportation and logistics healthcare industrial operations Uh, which will bring factory automation and remote control of industrial robots uh, remote inspections and maintenance and workers training and public safety and security which will be through intelligent video surveillance and security systems which will also have an emergency services could be provided border controls can be done today and drones can be used for emergency and robots can be used for all unsafe situations so that is a kind of uh, intelligent connectivity will be available to the digitalization process uh, this is an example of how the community based integrated healthcare will happen you will have outpatient care you will have emergency care you have in pain in patient care all giving connected to the uh, to the municipal hospital health centers and they will be able to at the point of at the point here as we call and then integrated to integrated health informatics and then finally they can be integrated to well equipped and innovate outreach where trained and motivated community health workers are available and they will be able to get referrals from the communities and they will be able to pass it on to the specialist and get advice and even using the robots and the other uh, measures like art like uh, you know, augmented reality and uh, uh, virtual reality they will be in a position to actually immerse themselves in the whole process of carrying out operations carrying out diagnosis carrying out variety of things so they are going to be an integrated healthcare system right from a, a, a corporate hospital to a primary health center down to the patient in the village so this is the one system which will certainly bring in a lot of sustainability features as far as the healthcare is concerned the manufacturing sector is also undergoing tremendous change you all come from the engineering background you will understand that in the early days we used to have what is called traditional manufacturing where we used to cut metal and make pieces and we used to create a lot of waste many times it was the traditional manufacturing then came the era of lean manufacturing where we started reducing the waste and everybody said that i am a lean factory and they used to all talk gaga about it then we said put an imposition that look your factory has to be clean you should not pollute you should be environmentally friendly you should not have any effluent and it used to be only 3r waste that was green manufacturing but now it is coming and it is becoming part of the today's system is called sustainable manufacturing in which in which one of the major uh, feature is innovation and the uh, approach is six r based and what are those six r which are re, uh, recover re, uh, reduce uh, recycle redesign remanufacture and reuse so these three r system will get transformed to the six r system and this is the first step towards circular economy that is what is going to happen this will reduce the material wastage this will reduce our pressure on the usage of the resources what are limited on the planet earth and will be certainly a major step in the direction of sustainability for the purpose of climate control and pollution the new factories will be called green factory lean clean and clean and that will basically 
for total energy efficient management, technical intelligence, mechatronics, dematerialization, management of hazardous uh, substances, remanufacturing and recycling, as I mentioned to you. All logistics will be green. Means you can't have trucks which will be polluting. You can't have systems which will pollute the place. No. And carbon footprint will be minimum. And all processes will be sustainable processes. Means all the elements of sustainability should be ensured. That means any process has to pass through the filter of sustainability. There won't be any waste, zero emissions, noise and air pollution. And they should have whatever products you will produce. They will have a long product life cycle. And that will be also taken care of as part of your manufacturing strategy. So vision is completely self-orchestrating factories will likely change the economics of manufacturing. What is available today, if you see, we have software-defined production processes, slowly additive manufacturing also, also finding place in our, uh, our system. CNC machines have been there for many decades now. We have surface mount technology placements now pick and place and we are able to push things on the, and we have laser cutters. And we are going to have soon self-organizing factory architecture and workflow. Depending upon the demand of the job, we should be able to reorganize ourselves. And that will be provided as part of the industry 4.0 revolution, which is taking place. And next level, teams of autonomous robots and human workers will work together for handling of parts and materials, assembly and quality control, and operation and maintenance of the production machinery. They will become an integral part of the industry 4.0, bringing in more and more machine to machine talk and machine learning, and also providing artificial intelligence as a decision making process. And finally, reducing the waste and improving efficiency. This is how it is going to happen. Uh, so if you see the inputs to the industry 4.0 and digital transformation, or as I mentioned to you, robotics, AI, collaborative machines, additive manufacturing, sensing, IoT, cyber physical systems, mobile computing, cloud, big data analytics, industrial biology, nanotechnologies, and neurotechnologies, all of them put together into the funnel will be part of the industry 4.0. And what it will be talking of? It will be talking of mobile technologies to the outside world using blockchain. It will be using virtual reality and augmented reality to simulate, showcase, and interact with the customers and so on. And basically working on open ecosystem and new interaction platforms will be created as part of this system. And this is the direction in which the transformation is taking place. Now coming to the energy, which is another pillar of the, of the, of the sustainable requirement. If you see energy, we had uh, on the x-axis, you see the emissions, initially high emissions, and, and on the right-hand side, you see emission-free. Similarly, on the y-axis, you see low efficiency, and on the top side, you see high efficiency. If you see the traditional energy production processes, even today, which are prevalent, they exhaust a lot of fuels and burden the environment, and they are basically uh, oil-based production, coal-based production, and gas-based production of the energy. As we progress, we realized, and in this period now we are going for what is called advanced energy production systems, which are energy efficient, which produce less emissions, both combined heat and power, and carbon capture and sequestration. And some people have started using the term now carbon capture and utilization because sequestration is a process which also involves a lot of money and there are certain uncertainties with respect to how long the sequestration will stay within the seabed and so on. And this is the time when we started developing the nuclear. Nuclear today is having uh, not so much of contribution, but over a period of time, as we have planned, nuclear tomorrow will have a larger contribution in terms of energy mix. But most important thing which is emerging today and which is part of the sustainable energy uh, strategy is the solar economy, which consists of solar-based production with high overall system efficiency. And this renewable includes solar power, wind power, ocean power, biopower, geothermal power, and hydropower. And you already have known that in our country, we have set goals for setting up uh, renewable energy systems by over 2020 to 175 gigawatts, out of which almost about 100 gigawatts is going to be from the solar energy, sorry, 60 gigawatts from the uh, plain solar and 40 gigawatts from the rooftop solar. And then we have, of course, the hydro and others. So there is a tremendous shift 
globally taking place towards the solar economy as far as the, um, the, the emissions are concerned. This is going to be the next chapter as far as the energy economy, energy security is concerned. There is a decarbonizing time in the energy sector. If you take the number of days required to set up a plant like solar and PV and wind, they take 8 to 12 months. Whereas if you look at the gas-based plant which is producing energy, in the open cycle, it takes almost 16 to 20 months. The closed cycle, it takes only 26 to uh, only 20 to 30 months. The close, uh, the coal, coal-based plants, even if we, even if go from the uh, subcritical to what we call the supercritical plants, and then tomorrow advanced ultra supercritical plants, the time cycle is ranging from 40 months to 60 months. And if you look at nuclear plants, which are of course the least polluting you will have almost about 80 months of time cycle. So there is obviously, if you want to uh, capture the, the, uh, the sustainability as early as possible, I think the shift towards renewable, which is going to take the least time, is the nice approach. Now, another thing which is emerging is the internet of energy, because we are seeing variety of energy producing systems coming in the way. We have the today traditional systems from coal, oil and so on. We have the renewable energy systems which are coming. So it is important to develop smart grid. And if you have the smart grid implemented in a kind of internet in which the energy package is managed similarly to the data packet, across routers and gateways, which autonomously can decide the best pathway for the packet to reach its destination. I think we would have arrived there because smart grids, which are autonomous in nature, taking into account the values of the inputs coming from the various energy sources, ensuring the demand uh, which is coming from the various users, and also technically keeping the uh, grids uh, safe and efficient. That is the kind of Internet of Energy system which has to be put in place along with a smart grid. And again, AI will play a major role in doing this. The smart cities, which have been announced by the government of India also and the globally also people are, work on, are working on that, are an outcome of the technologies what we have talked, which will provide smart business, smart living, smart education, smart uh, citizen, smart government, smart infrastructure, smart utility, and smart mobility, and, and smart environment. And all of them are becoming part, integral part of the smart city programs of the government of India, uh, in which the all facets of the smart city are being captured. And already in the smaller countries like Singapore, Malaysia and all, they have pitched in drastically, and Japan for that matter, to get as quickly as possible to the smart city concepts and arrive at such useful solutions. The, as I was mentioning to you, the next era of computing is the quantum technologies. So after 2025, the emerging quantum application services and universal quantum computers will boost quantum computing market. And quantum computing, quantum sensing, and cryptography will be the main three elements. 2020 itself, we have about $532 million market, which is growing at a CAGR of almost about 13%. And in 2025, you will have about 968 million. And I'm quite certain going from there to at a rate of 27%, we will have almost about uh, uh, 3,255 million kind of a market. So cryptography will be boosted by new use cases. And you will have through the quantum system, secure telecommunication in which key distribution is an ultra secure communication method that requires a key to decipher a message it will be made available. Quantum sensors, devices that exploits quantum entanglement to achieve a sensitivity or resolution that, that is better than can be achieved using a classical system. Applications are astrophysics, high energy physics, military quantum radars and so on. There are quantum computers which will certainly help in solving the computational problems like combinatorial problems that can be solved efficiently on quantum computers, linear algebra, databases, and so on. Applications like quantum chemistry, traffic control, real-time risk analysis, all of them will be part of the quantum applications. The another area which is emerging and we cannot uh, escape uh, this fact and which will also has to be taken care of part of the sustainability 
is not only the planet Earth, but the space also. Because we are venturing into different domains of the space. And there we are looking at what are the oil space, what are the things which are happening. For example, we have in the orbital space now, luxury space hotels, satellite servicing, commercial reusable spaceships, orbital refueling, spaceport operations. And then one more thing which is emerging is, because we are going into renewables and solar energy particularly, and solar energy on the ground, on the planet Earth has vagaries of the availability of sunlight. But if you have a space solar station located, and then you beam the solar energy from that onto the ground using a laser or the microwaves, then you have 24 into power 7, the solar energy available. So space solar stations will come as a new transformation. Besides, of course, what you are seeing today, the satellite data services, space manufacturing, automated mining, you will appreciate that on the planet, uh, on the moon, you have a huge amount of helium. And if we can do the mining of helium there and bring methods of bringing it to, our, to planet Earth, I think our problem of energy will be solved for entire lifetime. Same thing is going to happen in the case of lunar space, where you are going to have lunar surface mobility, autonomous robots, interplanetary payload delivery, and so on. And then exploration cannot be stopped because we want to learn more and more about the deep space. Asteroids mining will take place. Asteroid hauling will take place. You will have uh, removal of space debris. You will use 3D printing and construction robots for doing manufacturing and construction in the space. And of course, you will have complete planet transforming because of the space industry, space colonization, and the space tourism. So you have a huge technology transformation that is play taking place based upon what is happening on planet Earth to enrich the space exploration, use the space uh, assets for the benefit of the mankind, and also generate more and more knowledge about how we were created. The disruptive technologies to improve crew qualities of life indicators by 10 to 30% are faster and secure and affordable commuting, which is e-mobility, real-time navigation, integrated multimodal transportation, Commute times could be saved by 15 to 20 percent, and healthcare government work can be reduced by 45 to 60 percent. Smarter and faster public health response, telemedicine, AI, and big data, which will certainly reduce the health burden by greater than 4 percent. Developing cities achieve 5 percent reduction in spread of infectious diseases, and cleaner and more sustainable environment will come. That means waste to energy will find application and uh, there will be 6% reduction in building emissions and reduce air pollution considerably to the tune of 3 to 15%. But all this technology digital are disrupting traditional organizations and work. The traditional organizations and work are going to get disturbed. What will be the disturbance impact? You see that. What disruption will take place? 85% of customer citizen engagement will be done without human interaction by 2020. 65% of today's children will work in new job types that don't exist yet. 90% of employees anticipate more competition for talent. 80% of digital leaders highlight new ways of working as the top enablers. 57% of jobs at risk of automation. That is what is going to happen. And this has been also analyzed, which country is going to be maximum affected by loss of, of in terms of jobs losses because of automation. And you will see that 60% of the ICT enterprise decision makers planning, trialing, or deploying AI in next 18 months. 96% of the ICT enterprise decision makers will trialing and deploying AI in the next 18 months. That is what is going to happen. So that is a change. And you will find that there will be 69% of job loss in India, and the average will be about 57%. That is a kind of prediction. The way we are going to work is going to change now for sustainability because more and more, so you will have human, highly human only skills. You will have to create subjective reasoning, imagination, negotiation, questioning, which will become part of the various domains of your brain, design, storytelling, connectivity, creativity, and empathizing. There will be top skills which will be needed for doing this, which are, some of them are complex problem-solving skills, critical thinking, creativity, people management, 
coordinating with others, and emotional intelligence should be your question, judgment and decision making, and service orientation, negotiation, and cognitive flexibility. These are the new skills which are required for technology disruption. The traditional engineering, what we used to have once upon a time, will have a sustainable engineering form. In the traditional engineering, we've thought, we always considered of its object. Today, we are going to consider as a system. We focused on technical issues. We have to focus now on technical and non-technical issues. We solve the immediate problem now. How to solve it? No. We have to solve the problem forever. Consider the local contents. No. We have to consider the global concept. Locally, I may not uh, having any adverse impact of what innovation I do, but we have to see globally, am I going to uh, have any impact? If so, then we have to be careful. Then assumes others will deal with politics, ethics, and societal issues. That is what we think today. I'm a technical guy. I don't bother about these politics, ethics, and so on. No. In today's sustainable engineering mode, acknowledges the need for engineers to interact with experts in all the other disciplines related to the problem. And these are the engineering skills which you have to develop to, to, to be part of the sustainable development. System integration and synthesis, engineering science and analysis, problem formulation as well as solving, engineering design, ability to realize products, facility with intelligent technology to enhance creative opportunity, teamwork, language and multicultural understanding, ability to advocate and influence, and most important, entrepreneurship, management skills, and decision making, and knowledge integration and education. And for which it is essential that we follow the path of decision, uh, what we call it, the design thinking, which starts with discovery, then we go for framing the opportunity, we, then we go for incubation, then we go for ideation, then we go for uh, evaluation of the idea, then we go for rapid prototyping and testing, and delivering the final testing approval and launch, and and of course iterate and take it to a large scale. This is a this is a cycle which we have to follow, which is a cycle also uh, recommended for making any innovation to be successful. So this has to become part of the sustainable education program. And an engineers, you can't say you can't say choose what you are engineering for. Engineers can't be neutral. You have to follow this diagram. On the one side, you have affluence. On the other side, you have uh, technology. You have to be always in the um, sustainable leadership to go to the leftmost corner, which is the brilliant, which has no uh, impact on the, on, the, uh, on the planet Earth, and it meets all the requirement, minimum requirement. And the red corner you should never follow because it has a luxury and it has high impact. So we can't work for luxury and high impact. We have to between the brilliant and minimum needs and there. So this kind of a thrust we have to follow for taking decisions when you are sitting as an engineer. Education also has to transform and education should transform from what we have today. A participatory vision of sustainability should be provided in education. Second, number two is enabling conditions for sustainability. You should create those conditions in, uh, of sustainability. Like today, we have done the NEP 2020. We are enabling that condition. Competencies for sustainable transformations should be developed. That is the number three. That is the, the kind of education we have to provide, the kind of skills we have to provide. The pedagogies and learning strategies for education for sustainable development. ESD is very important and monitoring and evaluation of the ESD competencies and distance from a sustainable state. Uh, that, is the, that is the part of the education um, delivery and system. NEP 2020 in that direction is a positive step. It is second most promising source of disruptive technology. And uh, new education policy aims to drastically strengthen the education system to prepare the future generations to drive unique innovations while making India a knowledge superpower. One of the major highlights of NEP 2020 is to teach coding to students from class six. Technology-oriented new education policy will surely benefit the youth of today and create employment opportunities. And basically in a world defined by artificial and human intelligence, it is vital that we invest in both our people and our technology to achieve the sustainable growth. So that is what is going to happen. Even in your curriculum, the sustainable development is being integrated. 
in curricula, your research, in your mission, in your community outreach, in your public awareness, in your professional development, and even through a legislation, we have to make sure that higher education has got the elements of sustainability. And who is going to lead this kind of a sustainability map? A person who has who empower themselves to take responsibility. A person who looks for holistic interactions. A person who convenes authentic conversations. A person who can understand and create tensions, holds potential for breakthrough uh, thinking. Who can recognize that outcome unfold in complex dynamics. Who can notice and attend to human dynamics of transformative change who is not afraid of experimentation and reflects, earn, learn, adjust, and share. And most important thing, he grounds himself in the personal integrity. A person with these qualities will be the ideal person as a leader for sustainability. All this will lead to tomorrow, friends, into what we call as the Society 5.0, which is inclusive, sustainable, where various social challenges will be resolved by incorporating the innovations of the fourth industrial revolution. It will be an integration of the cyber space and the physical space, which will be human-centered, which will balance economic advancement and resolution of the social problems. And that is how this will be done, unlike in the case of Society 4.0, where cyberspace computers, human and physical state go up and down. Here it will be a clear indication where you will have real-time collection of detailed personal and non-personal data, and that will be part of the physical space. And this will go to the uh, cyberspace where AI algorithms will modulate it. And rapid technological evaluation and changes in business knowledge will evolve. From there, there will be a feedback of data by algorithms to the physical space. And then from there, you will go to the globalization business. So this is the kind of 5.0 in uh, society which will emerge tomorrow, which will have common core functions, databases, and which will have society systems, which are smart production, global environment control, new manufacturing, new energy value, intelligent transportation, infrastructure, all that what we discussed. And finally, a society that creates value will be part of this system that is what is going to be created. So this is society 5.0 in its totality. The enablers to accelerate innovation and investment that help grant these challenges are responsible technology governance, leadership to mobilize commitment and standards, partnership for collaboration, public policy and regulation for the fourth industrial revolution, finance mechanisms to stimulate market solutions, breakthrough innovations, data and tools, and capacity development and skills, which is very important. There are 12 ways sustainable technology uh, could change the world by 2030. AI optimized manufacturing, which will certainly reduce the waste by 50%. A far reaching energy transformation, which will reduce the carbon emissions. A new era of computing, which we talked in terms of quantum computing and automation. Healthcare paradigm shift to prevention uh, and provide healthcare to everybody. 5G will enhance the global economy and save lives. A new normal in managing cancer and in robotic retail, the use of robotic downstream as a hyper-local, as opposed to the traditional upstream application in the supply chain, will disrupt this 100-year-old 5 trillion industry and all its stakeholders will experience significant change. A clean energy revolution supported by digital twins, putting individuals, not institutions, at the heart of the healthcare which is engineering, biology, machine learning, and the sharing economy, establish a framework for decentralizing the healthcare continuum. The future of construction has already begun. We are already talking of 3D, 4D printing for safe construction and reducing the disease. The carbon dioxide removal will help to reverse the climate change and a new era in medicine. AI is that new tool that will enable us to extract more insights at an unprecedented level from all medical big data <laughs> that has never really been fully taken advantage in the past. <laughs> Sorry. So where do we go? We should look at <clears throat> what should be our strategy. What is the future we want to create? We should look back. Redefine how to move towards 2020. And from there, move forward. That is the way we have to look at. And for this, the only way is to do what is called the <coughs> what we call as a sustainability education system. Education for sustainable development. That is called handprint. 
In which it is vital that we invest, instigate change in order to improve living standards of all and reduce the impact on planet. Choices we should make will shape our opportunities in future and those of our future generations. But availability of alternative models and vision for sustainable future is not enough. What we need is an action. Education is a key driver to achieve this transformation. Education for sustainable development encourages a shift from viewing education as a delivery mechanism to a lifelong, holistic, and inclusive learning process. Handprint is a measure of ESG action. Action that is directed to decrease the human footprint and make the world more sustainable. <laughs> Handprint is a new tool being developed by Center of uh, Education. One needs to ask what one does at individual community. Need. The handprint analyzes positive impact on the three aspects of sustainability, economy, uh, society, and environment. So various questions cover each aspect. Investigating on amongst others, you use resources, your social engagement, your awareness of sustainability. While a footprint is the negative effect you leave on the global resources, Handprint is your positive efforts towards sustainability. Please note these words. Handprint is your positive efforts towards sustainability. So my answer is increase your handprint and decrease your footprint. And fundamentally, it is about how we lead change, collaborate and innovate to empower people and make this a peaceful and inclusive development revolution. We must respond with human-centered policies that empower all women and men, strengthen the capacity of governments, and rally the multilateral systems around shared narratives. This is all I would like to share with you as far as the sustainability and transformation for sustainability is concerned. Hope the student community, the academicians, the people who are listening to this will have some uh, ideas captured out of it to implement in their day-to-day -day development processes and make this planet Earth sustainable, livable for the future generations with best efficiencies and best achievement. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful lecture. I'm sure that I'm speaking on behalf of the entire audience watching us right now that you have positively revealed groundbreaking thoughts and promising ideas while instilling a new perspective in our lives. We would now like to ask you a few questions. Please. India has joined the group of elite nations in BMD systems, ICBM, anti-satellite missiles, and many more. What would be the next target that India could achieve in these coming years? See, the way technology is growing in these areas, as many of these I have discussed, all these technologies will find place in the, in the defense systems also, because you mentioned the defense systems. Whether it is artificial intelligence or data analytics or all, they will find place in cybersecurity. They will find place in what is called non-contact warfare, where people-to-people -people warfare will not take place, it will be basically on a non-contact basis. So you will, we will have to develop what is called kinetic energy weapons, where those could be used using drones, those could be used for unmanned aircrafts, those could be used from satellites, and more and more information can be gathered, analyzed in real time. The armed forces uh, can, be, uh, can be informed in real time about the situations arising on the battlefield. We should be able to keep track of our depleting um, uh, resources arsenal and then change our strategy. All this will form part of the new technologies which are emerging. So laser driven weapons which are going to happen is the future. And uh, instead of using in the current explosive weapons, it will be the non-contact laser driven weapons which will find place. Already this is happening. I'm sure this will uh, go into a larger scale. That was an interesting perspective. Uh, moving on, what are your thoughts on the recent changes that took place in the defense acquisitions, such as the offset policy and the changes in FDI, including the changes in stakeholders and the recent import ban on defense equipments? 
three steps which the government of India has taken are very positive steps. While uh, I would say that offset policy has been there uh, for many years, but I think the changes which have been suggested now will certainly in increase the the the, the, uh, the absorption of not only the, the the business but also technologies through offset. Then second thing which is happening is. Uh, this list of items which are banned from import will spur the Indian industry to develop, design and develop and manufacture equipments for the armed forces, increasing the indigenous content and also bring our country within the ambit of Atmanirbhar Bharat. Third one is, it will certainly increase innovation because once we allow this kind of uh, preferential market access to the indigenous product, there will be incentives for the industry. So you will have a level playing field for the industry. You will have good partnership between the industry and the academia and the armed forces, which will enable them to produce things uh, of the world class uh, for, 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 the, uh, for the armed forces. So all the three steps, all the three decisions which the government of India has taken are very important and very useful in making our uh, country Atmanirbhar as far as the defense is concerned. It's already visible. I can see it happening. Yes, so it is a matter of great pride for Indians. Uh, also, you must have seen today in the in the Indian Air Force parade, a large number of Indian products are already uh, in the site. Yes. I used to see in the 90s, where I used to see only the imported equipment being displayed. Today, we have Indian equipment already in the arsenal of the armed forces. So, this is an increasing tendency and I certainly feel very happy about it. Yes. Uh, India is among the top five strongest militaries in the world. But most of the Indian defense equipments are of foreign origin. So what are your views on that? You see, we had a, uh, we had a situation because after our independence, uh, we did not have uh, practically any infrastructure for indigenously developing or designing or manufacturing uh, the defense equipment. So obviously to defend our nations, we had to do a level of import and that import continued for uh, some time. So we developed all our strategies towards the imported equipment and that's why you saw most of it imported. But we took uh, what is called actions for indigenization. As a result, governments created infrastructure for research and development in the form of DRDO. It created manufacturing agencies like ordnance factories and large number of pub defense public sector undertakings uh, to manufacture uh, the foreign equipment under license in the country and take the Indian uh, designs into production. So this took some time. The other element which is essential for increasing the indigenous content which did not happen uh, was the participation of the academia which has started happening now in the last about 20-25 years, which has resulted into the LCA Tejas, where the academia interested, the missile programs of the country, where you know, academia and the industry and the DRDO interacted, and radar programs in the country, where again three of them work together. And today we have the capability because of that, of manufacturing, designing, and developing anything. In fact, we are manufacturing nuclear submarines today in our country. We are manufacturing aircraft in our country. So it's a gradual process. And that process, as I mentioned to you, is visible that it is making inroads. But it took some time because our industrial base was not all that strong. For our country to reach the level of industrial base, to support large-scale manufacturing of complex technology defense products took some time. But I think now we have arrived and we are on the right path. Yes, so I hope we continue on this path. I would now like to hand it over to our director, sir, Dr. Dhiren Patel, for an interesting conversation. Yeah, um, good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, so let me... Yeah, so this is... Uh, sort of a technical and non-technical uh, conversation. So thank you very much for this power pack uh, talk. Uh, it has covered a lots of landscape. Now, uh, as we as you touched upon many strategies and uh, including uh, I mean, new education policy, have you discounted the COVID effect? 
the covid effect by means of for example it has taken care of global warming and carbon effect like airlines and railway in india are practically stopped working uh, oil consumption has reduced to the drastic level so that in may it was you know available at negative price and uh, we are accustomed to work from home many sectors are disappearing and many will disappear as we have learned and uh, are accustomed to essentials and uh, Uh, i feel that the focus should be on healthcare and food security and uh, another thing is you know this covid phenomenon we, what we are waiting for are we channelizing our resources to cure or to to or are are we waiting for someone to discover some vaccine sort uh, can you give some uh, i mean thoughts on that thank you i think the, uh, the present scenario and particularly covid very clearly uh, sorry the, the new uh, and policy very clearly talks of what is called hybrid system of education this certainly has uh, been factored because we are finding it is not because of covid but because of the evolution of the technology that the uh, education system has to transform itself and already it is happening since you have been part of the education system the moocs program and the, the remote um, uh, you know learning and things like that which is already happening now it's only to be enlarged to a scale because of the covid in a, uh, to a, to a large and major and this has been factored uh, extensively as far as this is concerned now there is a infrastructure problem to support this and that's why government of india has taken major initiative in bringing in network efficiency to a higher level so that we are in a position to have high data rates visibility to all and also immersive experience of education with respect to ar and vr and uh, other things even there is a skilling requirement which is emerging today for the teachers to prepare themselves to actually graduate from what they have been doing to uh, to take care of uh, the remote learning and the online learning uh, online coaching so all these processes have been factored so we all know that hybrid mode of education will be the future as far as the uh, research and development priorities are concerned seeing what happened in covid uh, government has realized that in the r and d pyramid the top most priority will be given to two sectors one of them is healthcare which includes drugs pharmaceuticals and the devices and diagnostic equipments and so on and so forth uh, which is a major part and also the infrastructure for healthcare uh, as i mentioned in my slides which are telemedicine and things like that which are extremely extended to the remotest corner in our country and a policy framework to be initiated along with that in addition to that self reliance in the case of drugs and pharmaceuticals that means all that dependence what we had uh, for import uh, of importing um, apis and the key source materials from china and other countries for producing drugs in our country all this has to go in fact this morning only i had a meeting with the with the secretary um, pharmaceuticals and uh, industry partners uh, to to work out a road map how we can make ourselves self reliant on this particular aspect so there's a major push as far as uh, health sector is concerned education sector through the nep 2020 i think there is going to be a major um, push both in terms of changing the structure of our education not uh, coming away from the rote learning to creative uh, thinking and creative learning and project based thinking and also integrating the vocational courses as part of the uh, system and many many changes have been uh, and suggested including the foundational um my training which is required uh, for the children below the age of 5 to have proficiency in mathematics and languages and so on so i think it's a 360 degree approach with the nep has given i'm sure it is going to solve many of the problem as far as the rnd is concerned investment is a major issue so there it will be prioritized because you will notice that because of covid there has been tremendous economic impact in fact uh, there has been negative uh, gdp which is going on and because of that there will be fiscal constraints and those fiscal constraints will drive us to take on those projects which can deliver immediately if we are not going to take those such of those projects which are going to um, which are going to have long gestation period 
projects which will deliver immediately and solve country's problem that should be the order in which the priorities will be set in. and uh, there's a lot of thinking going on in this direction uh, certainly there will be uh, issues of economy and for that reason only the all the packages which the government of india has announced to support the msmes to support the construction market to support the infrastructure market all of them will certainly spur the economic growth again but only with one uh, one 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 uh, advice that the precautions which are suggested by the health workers by the health experts have to be observed by all of us not only for next 2 3 months but maybe for a year or so to ensure that we contribute towards the economic development but we also remain safe and healthy so that is the, the that is a broad framework in which the government is working and uh, i'm sure uh, this will become the new normal and we all will follow that thank you sir thank you over to you urvi are there any questions from the students any other yeah i think um, i am very happy that uh, you have uh, been able to organize this talk i suppose i am try i have tried to give you a picture of where the technology is moving how we can make our planet earth sustainable being an engineering institution many of the things are quite relevant to you because uh, they, they they go across to all disciplines of engineering because uh, um, digital is common whether it is civil mechanical electrical automobile anywhere chemical process control anything so everybody has to be part of that era second thing is the education for sustainability i think it's very important that the concept of sustainability is imbibed among all the students and the faculty so that when you make your choices they are uh, basically passing through the filter of sustainability in a big way these are the things i would like to say and finally i would like to thank the the team uh, v vj 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 ti vjti yeah. uh, for organizing this and giving me this opportunity to interact with all of you thank you very much sir uh, yeah yeah just a moment urvi so this vjti is a victoria jubilee technical institute set up in 1887 and mm. is responsible for setting up industrial base of india it is one of the pioneer and when we started it was a merely a training institute but as uh, we grew in fact vjti has been responsible of setting up iits during 1955 to 1960 three founder directors of five iits were from vjti wow uh, yes like professor kelkar of iit kanpur was vjti electrical engineering faculty professor uh, sen gupto of iit madras founder director was vjti principal at that time and kelkar was also happened to be planning officer of iit bombay but then later on vjti has been taken over by maharashtra government as a one of the jewel and it become a state run institute later and however uh, as we moved on we tried to shift our uh, focus from training to research and now our motto is technology for society so while we look at the problems Uh, of society to improve quality of life and we are now pro producing responsible engineers and ethical citizens thank you good that's a great job i i had heard of vjti as a great institution for automobile engineering when i was a student of engineering in 60s and 70s okay thank you So we are honored by your presence. Thank you for the impactful and thought-provoking session. We hope you all enjoyed the session. The upcoming GLS will be held on the 10th of October, 5 p.m. The speaker for which is Admiral Sunil Lanba. Stay tuned. I am Urvi Ranjan signing off. Until next time, this is Techno Manza VJTI. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you very much. Thank you so, very much. So, so we would like you to wait for some time. Sure. Uh,